Hello, I'm Joy Thomas, and today we're going to be concentrating on drawing the portrait from life in charcoal. I'll be showing you how to break it down in simple steps that anyone can follow. You know, the most important thing about portraiture is the drawing. And it's essential, if you're going to capture a likeness, that the drawing be accurate. Now, we're going to begin today by toning our paper with charcoal dust and a chamois cloth. That way we can start with a toned surface that we can lift or erase easily. To tone the paper, you may want to pick up one of these sandpaper paddles that artists use to sharpen pencils. Take your soft charcoal and just sand across and make dust this way. If you don't have sandpaper like this, you can just use any sort of scrap of sandpaper. You may also use a knife. This is a little slower. But at any rate, what we want is just a nice dusting, kind of like putting powdered sugar on a cake. Now we start with a chamois cloth. This is dirty, quite dirty on one side, or seasoned as we like to say. And we're just going to gently take this and begin the toning process. We take that dust and just gently, without much pressure, hardly any pressure at all, we begin to tone the paper. And there we have it. So now we take the toned paper and we clip it to the board, the drawing board, that has been secured to our easel. Now I have a pad of paper that is actually the pad that the, the paper came from under here for cushioning to draw and a large rubber band that secures the paper from flopping at the bottom. So everything's secure and we're ready to go. And now it's time to turn our attention to setting the pose and to the model. So when the model arrives, make sure you are prepared. Have drapery, comfortable seat, water available. Maybe if your model likes music, let them pick it out. Those are all details that you will do intuitively. But the important thing is when you're beginning charcoal drawing is to make things as easy as possible for yourself. So here I'm using a mid-tone drapery. I sort of like a greenish gray tone because it does a good job of being a contrast to the skin tones. This is all in the beginning and we're just trying to keep it into value. So this mid-tone value will sort of represent our mid-tone paper. We want to set the pose, full face, profile, you know, whatever you want. You need to make sure the model is comfortable and that you are excited by the pose. So go ahead and pick what you like when you're setting your model up. Here today, I've selected a three-quarter pose that I prefer for the model, who happens to be my husband, Fred. And I'm looking for lighting that will give me a really noticeable shape map. Here we see the model without the strong lighting, and that can be very interesting, but it's a little bit difficult and challenging. I want you to see form. And by lighting the model with direct lighting from one point, we will be able to see that form more clearly. Now, once you have the model all set up and you have your lighting and everything the way that you want it, it can be a little overwhelming to see all of this information. And I've found that it helps to make one of these viewers. This is made from just a simple, cheap mat board or mount board that you cut apart and then put back together with paper clips. And this can slide to change sizes for you. And the way that you, you do this is hold it, step back from your paper and squint one eye and look through and make sure that when you hold it onto the paper that the dimensions are equal to the dimensions of your paper or your canvas. And then making sure that you hold this, lock the arm. We're going to look at the model and sort of contain the information that we have in front of us. It's important that we visualize the model as a finished drawing or painting. And this viewer will help us do just that. Make sure you squint one eye 
and then you can see information that you need to work with for this day. And there you go. No more excuses. We have to start drawing now. But I've found that my confidence level is increased if I do this one little thing. We're going to draw a perimeter around our paper. I do this on paintings also. This perimeter represents an area that we will lose anyway to the framer when we take this in. So I just don't want you to think about that. Forget about it. It, it isn't even a part of your composition. Now we're going to go from corner to corner and begin to divide the space. And when we hold our viewer up, we want to imagine this same grid existing inside the viewer. And some people actually put wi florist wire or string inside that viewer. And then I come down the middle, so I go from corner to corner first, that establishes the middle approximately. And then I go from side to side. And now I have these four quadrants. And they can be subdivided too, so that we can go ahead and make this diamond. And we have these new four points. And this is really useful in landscape painting. This is useful in still life painting and also in portraiture. Today, I want to keep in mind that I'm containing the head within this diamond at the top and introducing the lower part of the mandible into the top or triangular part of this bottom diamond. As long as I involve those, I'll be able to keep the focus and the composition the way I like it. So we want to establish the composition now. We have the model all set up. We've looked through our viewer and we've um, been able to kind of determine what we want the finished drawing to look like. And while holding this, I found that it's really helpful to go ahead and look from the top of the head to the top of the mat and find that distance. Always try to keep about a forehead's distance in there or you know, more or less. Top of the head to the bottom of the chin. I want the middle of the face to land somewhere above center. Now the center will typically be somewhere around the nose or you know somewhere around there but I know that it's approximate. I want to leave enough room at the bottom so that I can include the opening of the collar and the neck and that sort of thing. So it helps to draw while holding this but I'll put it down now and go ahead and draw without it. Don't try that at home. Top of the head, bottom of the chin. We're going to come down and approximate for now just about where the, uh, the neckline comes down and the shoulders. So I'm making a little mark for that. Now in order to really measure, I hold a brush or a pencil out and I do thumb measuring by sliding the thumb up and down um, the pencil or the paintbrush or whatever. So I'm going to hold this up, squint one eye again, and I'm measuring from the top of the head to the bottom of the chin. I'm going to drop that measurement down, and just as I suspected, from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of the opening of the shirt is um, equal. So if I actually come in here and measure, and I guess here, do I have it about the same? No. I have this uh, sh too short. Because I know that this is the bottom of my picture, that this is the bottom of the image, I know that I have to adjust this middle section. I don't want to adjust here and I don't want to adjust here because the image will blow out bigger than what I have originally determined through my viewer. So I'm going to adjust this measurement. Here we go again. Top of the head to the bottom of the chin is equal from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of this little placket here. So let's say it's about like that. I'll move this up. And now am I closer? I'm getting closer. Ooh, dramatically off. But this is how we test for mistakes right in the beginning. So somewhere in there. Close enough. I know that I'm going to go top of the head, bottom of the chin, somewhere in here. And I need to keep in mind that I don't want to compress this. Maybe I should measure from the opening where the skin is on the shirt up to where the shadow turns on the chin. You know that point there? So let me see what that does. Now see, if Fred was a landscape, we wouldn't have to worry too much. 
Okay, that's good. So now I know it's right where the where the head turns back. If that's the top of the head, it's right where the forehead makes the turn back. And then I have a measurement that I like a little better. Now, can you believe I took that long to do that? But you have to be really careful in the beginning determining where you want the bottom of the picture to be and the top of the picture to be. It's so important that your drawing have a breathing room. But now I'm going, because I've done this, I've decided this is the top of the head, this is the bottom of the chin. Approximately, I can change this a little bit, but not too much. I also know that it helps to say from the top of the head to the bottom of the chin, if I figure out the middle of that, that's usually somewhere around the eyes. The eye sockets are somewhere around in there. And from that, in the middle here, from that mark to the bottom of the chin, the eye mark to the bottom of the chin, then we have the nose in the middle of that. So it's halfway, from the top of the head to the bottom of the chin, halfway, eye sockets. From the eye sockets to the bottom of the chin, halfway, bottom of the nose. From the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin, halfway, should be the mouth area. You know, so even here you can almost see that it's starting to look, yeah, maybe there's a little face in there. Here we go, now I'm looking for the axis of the head. And the axis goes, is the middle of the face, and because it's turning away, I can't put it right on the middle. I'm coming to one side and reminding myself that there's a sweep, an axis, sweeping this way. Then I look for these circular, you know, I wanna think about the space, and I'm squinting my eyes down so that I start seeing and looking at this in terms of a shape map, a light and dark. 